This right. is the moment when I realize that I've drank way too much coffee and I'm like buzzing. Jeff, you should get more coffee. Yeah, I've got a <laughs> French press waiting for me out there. Nice. Yeah, I did some espresso. I drank a whole pot. Fresh pots. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, welcome everybody to week four of the I'm with the crew webinar. Um, we've got our, our normal folks with us. We've got Jim Digby and we have Shelby, our producer, and we have Taryn Longo from Mastery Studio. And we have a just incredible Dave Sherman from everything. Basically, I think Dave runs the world. Um, that's my title. And we have a very special guest today. We have Jeff Rickley from the band Thursday. Uh -huh. And I'm just going to toss this straight over to Dave Sherman to get us started on what we're going to talk about today and why it's important. Thanks, Misty. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> here's Tom with the weather. Um, <laughs> we were talking about how the process of recovery can be tough under the best circumstances. And give or take three weeks ago, everything we all know went out the window. Um, you know, and Jeff and I have been having some talks lately about how when you got a little time on your belt, staying sober, you know, you have some rhythm and, and, but there are people we know that like are literally in early recovery and you know, how hard that can be and not connect with people and how things have shifted so quickly onto online and zoom meetings. And we wanted to kind of tailor a whole one or possibly two episodes about just getting sober addiction maybe even maintaining recovery and and keeping it you know staying sober and staying sane when you can't physically hang out with people that get you yeah. we were talking about how connection with people that have similar backgrounds can be so vital to maintaining your mental health and and, and sanity and serenity and sobriety um dave and jeff how long have you guys been sober so different answers for both of us. Uh, for me, it's two and a half years. Uh, February 5th, 1999. So about 21 years and change. So you're <clears throat> definitely at very different levels of where you're at in that process. Um, do both of you use a program? Are you both involved in a program? I am, yeah. And Dave, uh, Dave was largely responsible for getting me to... Uh, try a program um we tried a couple before i got to the one that i'm on now but um but yeah do you guys want to talk a little bit about what what programs are out there because i know i mean obviously there are the the big you know na aa alanon alateen but um dave and shelby were telling me about a lot of programs that i had never heard of before um do you want, want to go through what some of some of the options are and you know i know Jeff, you spoke a little bit too about having, trying a few alternative methods. Um, yeah. You guys want to talk on that a little bit? Sure, yeah. Um, should we start with the big two? Because they're kind of, or, or should we end up there? What's and, and, and I also want to say that you don't have to just pick one. No, 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 no. Yeah, like they all kind of can complement each other. Absolutely. Yeah, everybody's heard of AA and NA 12-step programs. Um, that are literally everywhere. One of the great benefits is every city and every town in every country you will go to, you'll be able to find a 12 step meeting of one sort or another. There are something like 14 or 15 million recovering people that are actively engaged in, in those processes. Mm -hmm. um, they're free. Um, they're fantastic. There are also uh, refuge recovery, which is like a Zen Buddhist way and also Dharma recovery. They're kind of parallel, um, a Zen Buddhist recovery method. Um, celebrate recovery is like a very Christian, which I'm not a religious guy, but some people are, and that's fantastic for them. Um, smart recovery is, is relatively new last couple of years. It's starting to gain some traction. It's a more science-based cognitive behavioral because AA has like a, a spiritual bent to it. And if you're just more of a scientist or an atheist or agnostic, smart might be the way to go. Not a ton of meetings, but it's, it's getting there. Um, yeah. yeah. I notes? tried that one. If you remember, Dave, I, I was, uh, you know, I was one of those people. I very much did not want to go to NA or AA. I resented the cliches that people threw around. I resented, uh, you know, the, the, the religious side of it. I resented the claims of how effective it was. It works if you work at that kind of stuff, all, all that kind of stuff. I, I really resisted it. And so it was like, try everything else first. 
And of course I had tried some NANA just to be able to be like, I hate it. You know what I mean? Like I just want to work for me. As long as I could say it doesn't work for me, then I don't have to worry about the fact that there is something that could help me get sober and I could the, keep- The room's full of people that were sober. Yeah, fuck those guys. Yeah. Right, like if I admitted that that could work for me, then why, why am I not getting sober was sort of my journey into it. And- um, It's really well put. So I went to Smart and, um, and I, I will say like Smart had some great stuff. Uh, you know, a lot of good stuff about breaking cycles of shame and stuff like that, which um, big part of not getting sober can be the shame over being an addict at all is so shameful that it's really hard to talk about. You don't want to open up to anybody um, and stuff like that. There was also some like they do a lot of uh, acronyms, you know, like SMART, <laughs> um, but ways that you can remember, like you have to watch out if you get hungry, you know, halt the hungry, angry, lonely, tired. And there's there's all kinds of stuff like that about breaking behavior patterns. Little mnemonics and yeah. Yeah. Just good stuff to hang on to throughout the day. Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, though, like Dave said, uh, much harder to find a meeting. Um, you can't just decide at noon on a Tuesday that you need to go to a smart meeting and just find one within 10 blocks of you, like AA and NA, which is a huge, huge benefit. Especially if you're a touring musician or a touring crew right. member. Just right. being able to get any, I mean, within blocks of any venue you're in in the entire country and world, you will find something. I've done tours where I found, I found a, a meeting in every single city. Yeah. Um, it's possible. It's definitely possible. Which is hugely reassuring. Yeah. Has there ever done any tours where um, you you had your own meetings? Is that is that common, or is that where the anonymous part of it kind of plays in, or how does that work? Well, Warp Tour, for instance, you know, was relatively proactive, starting probably eight or nine years ago, ten years ago, maybe even, where uh, in catering every night at eight o'clock. It was a 12 step meeting. It was fantastic. Um, which is, you know, in a traveling festival like that with 60 bands, and, you know, people are just out of their minds all day long. It was great. <laughs> Not anyone in particular, but I heard stories. Hey, Jeff, are you finding yeah. that? Um, thanks for participating, first of all. Oh, my really pleasure. Thank you, Jeff. That you can be a part of this uh, and for sharing your story. Um, I'm curious, do you find that the conditions of the quarantine and and this kind of isolation and not, you know, not being able to do what we used to do. Are they specifically challenging or additionally challenging? How is that impacting your journey? Well, you know, I think the first couple of weeks, it was like, I knew it was really serious. And um, I was sort of prepared for it to get really bad. And I was keeping busy going to lots of AA meetings, calling my sponsor all the time, calling my sponsee, just checking in on everybody, making sure everybody was doing okay. And I felt in those first two weeks like, oh, actually I feel pretty good. I feel more connected to people than I have in a while even maybe, you know, and, and, uh, and I, I was just basically being a rock for everybody. And I was like, this isn't gonna be so bad, you know? And then like two weeks in and I'm like not facing any of my own like fears or, or loneliness or, you know, this stuff that I'm repressing. And it's like, suddenly I felt myself starting to crumble. Um, and I, it definitely harkens back to, to recovery for me where as soon as I say like, I got this, I'm okay. It's like, everybody's like, Oh no, <laughs> as soon as he says he's got it and he's okay. It means he's not dealing with anything and he's about to fall apart. Like everybody take cover. Um, so I'm, I'm revisiting that. Yeah. And I would, think that that like there are a lot of people like from my kind of concern I guess um, from the, what I'm seeing is that people who don't necessarily identify as addicts and maybe are not actually addicts um, but that the conditions of this quarantine mm -hmm. are bringing them into these coping mechanisms where it's like strangely socially acceptable to just say hey it's wine o'clock and like drink lots of wine all day and like like hoarding bottles of wine in addition to the toilet paper <laughs> and <laughs> you know and just like what like I'm curious what you feel Dave about like could that even um create an addiction in these these circumstances well first of all nobody ever says it's heroin o'clock <laughs> It's really a little hey. it again. Hey, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Let's throw it out there. Um, <laughs> there's a t-shirt. Um, I don't know that these conditions could create alcoholism. It's always a pre-existing condition, but can it exacerbate it? Sure. 
you know, isolation and, and it's a disease of emotions and, and, you know, anything you're feeling outside the norm and we're creatures of habit. And when you get thrown out of your, your normal routines, sure, it can definitely reinforce that. And somebody that's doing well when they're suddenly thrown into isolation, you know, can spiral. Yeah, that's what, that's what I'm kind of seeing because I work primarily with people who have um, a history of trauma and they'll find themselves in a steady place before uh, another traumatic event occurs, right? And then that rug gets pulled out from underneath them. They thought they had a strong footing and now all of a sudden they don't. What they were relying on is pulled out from under them and they go back into their old coping mechanisms or that pressure builds, like especially people, anxiety, that high activation is really common for people who have a history of trauma. And so that pressure builds and builds and builds and they wanna drink or smoke weed or do something to release that pressure. But then that becomes the only mechanism in which they know how to release it. Yeah, that's, I mean, when, you know, when I was trying to get sober, there was, um, I was one of those people who would like get really high and start researching all, you know, what is addiction? Like, how does it work? You know, like I, I was like, I can figure this out. If I get high enough, I'll find the right answer. Right. Um, but one of the things that I definitely read about that study about isolation on, on, uh, rats that, you know, whether or not they choose the water with cocaine or the, the, the water that's just water that, that, that changed a lot when you put them in a community of other rats like themselves, like a rat playground or a rat paradise or whatever they called it. And that's just, you know, I mean, that's obviously, that's not humans, but there is some evidence that isolation is uh, a scientific fact. You know, it's actually, it's, it means something to addiction. I just got to, I'm sorry, but like picturing you re- researching the rat playground. <laughs> <laughs> like at like 2 a.m. Like really high, like, oh, shit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> He's not the only one that did that. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many people right now, like, oh, man, I didn't know it was the only I thought I was the only one. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, Dave, you mentioned something to me the other day about something called the disease model concept. Yeah. And I'm not familiar with that, um, but... I know that like one of the the big things you know surrounding addiction is how other people view it and the the viewpoint and the stigma of why can't you just fucking not do it (laughs) you know why can't you just not do that and there's a a brain you know a brain chemistry like process behind it do you want to explain that a little bit right um there's definitely a lot of ignorance in terms of alcoholism. Like, why can't you control your drinking? Or if you really loved her, you just have two. Or why can't you just drink on the weekends? And a lot of alcoholics also are trying to control their use. Um, and then in the 60s, the American Medical Association came out and, and declared that alcoholism and addiction are a disease. Um, and the reason that is, is because, and, and I'm not a doctor, but it makes sense in three ways it parallels a disease in that it's a chronic condition, like it does not go away. If you're truly an alcoholic, you will never be able to drink like a normal person. It is progressive in that it, it gets worse over time. Um, you need more and more and you have to drink more and more frequently. Um, and then if untreated, it's fatal. And when you look at alcoholism, yeah, that actually does make a lot of sense. Um, anyway, what was the second part of the question? There was something else. Um, just explaining the, the neurological, oh, the, the, yeah. I, okay. it's, it's a disease. The people talk about how we are powerless over drugs and alcohol because 80 to 85% of people can use drugs and alcohol or mostly alcohol in a, in a social way and that they can have a drink or two at the end of a hard day or on the weekend. And once or twice a year at a wedding or New Year's Eve, they get drunk, perfectly normal behavior. But 15% or 20% of people have what we consider an allergic reaction to alcohol or drugs and that you take a little bit and it triggers the phenomenon of craving. And then you just keep going until the natural reaction being you're hammered. A simple definition of alcoholism would be somebody that drinks to get drunk. There isn't a shut off valve for people like us. Once we start, you know, suddenly it's 2 a.m. and I got three finals I was supposed to study for. I mean, I remember when that was first described to me and I had this flashback to college where literally every semester you know, I had three finals the next day and I was going to have one beer because I was so stressed out and it was two in the morning. And I was like, how did I do this again? And when I got sober, I was like, well, that actually explains it, which helps with the guilt and the shame because you realize, you know what, I've got a disease. I got to do something about it. Death and, 
and Dave, what tends to, I'm curious, like what tends to lead to that trigger? So if you're, you, once you start taking that first drink, right? I imagine if you were to track backwards, there was an experience that you're having prior to deciding to have that drink or, or wanting that one drink that will lead to the many others. What's that? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. You want to, you want to take that one, Jeff? Well, I think my answer is probably going to be slightly different than Dave's because my drug of choice was heroin and that's got a little bit of a different, I think, um, a little bit of a, a different lead up, you know, where it was like over the course of months, I'd be like, wow, that was really like, made me feel a lot better about a bunch of stuff. And, uh, man, I, you know, I can't do that too often. I don't want to have a problem. This is just like, you know, that was, that was really nice. And then I think about it and a month would go by and I'd be like, man, I really, really stressed. I really would love to just let it all go a little bit for a day or a weekend or something. And then, uh, and then, it, and then it was, you know, the type of thing that I thought like, I'll know when there's a line and I won't cross that line. That's important. And then, when I was sort of like, am I about to cross a line? You know, maybe I better stop. And it was like, it's become every other day. That seems like a, a lot. And it's like, you take three days and you just feel like you're going to die all the time. And uh, yeah, it just stops being, for me, I mean, the really easiest way to describe it is it just stops being a choice. Um, there's almost nothing I w wouldn't do to get it. It's really just that's it's just that simple, you know. There's not not a whole lot I could think of that would be worse than the feeling of not having it. Right, right. That's a really yeah. That's a really different experience than alcohol. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because just the absence of it is the buildup, basically. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we want Fine. to connect that back to um, to where we are today in in this self-isolation and the stressors of you know where's the money going to come from where's the food going to come from and where's the you know that emotional satisfaction going to come from that you know as a musician and as someone who supports musicians you know that's important for our daily existence how are you fighting through those things jeff how are you maintaining you know i think that's a really good question because it's, it's tough. You know, it's really like tested a lot of the things that, uh, that I thought I was really solid on, you know, two and a half years is just, a, just, it's long enough to feel like, all right, I've got some experience in this. I know if I keep doing what I'm doing, it's going to keep working. You know, I felt, felt pretty confident about that. And then you get, you get, you know, the, the carts off the tracks and you're like, Oh, I, yeah. I can't do my routine. This, I can't do my. Yeah, this is one you couldn't have prepared for. Right. I mean, we're all caught off guard by this one. And and right. You just want it to go away. Absolutely. I mean, and for me, that's been kind of trying to double down on fundamentals, which just is such an unexciting answer. You know what I mean? It's a very like boring answer, but like double check in with people, you know, like make sure I don't miss the meetings that are easy to miss because I'm not doing anything. Um, you know, it's one of those, it's, it's ironic. It's way easier to get there. I just go into my bedroom and hit, you know, the zoom password. And so it's twice as tempting to be like, but do I really have to? I mean, they won't even notice my face isn't in the little Brady Bunch window, right? Like, they don't yeah. care. Um, so it's like really making sure I, I'm there. It's when I see like a call from my sponsee who might need help being like, ah, oh, shit, I don't want to talk to him. I'm about to finish Better Call Saul. Like, you know, being like, I better pick it up then. You know, all that little stuff of just really staying more on top of, of it than I, than I would otherwise. You know, like not giving it any room to grow or breathe or, or any of that stuff just really trying to stay as close to people as I can and that sense of giving it away to, to get it which is a big fundamental of NA and AA which is that you you can't keep sober without helping another person get sober and I, I, I so that. I guess that I, I guess the big question is is it harder now because we're in this situation I would imagine it's a lot harder to get sober now I think staying sober I think it's possible, you know, it may be more challenging, but I do think it's possible. Um, I think coming in, getting sober now, I mean, detoxing at home, not going to a hospital because you're afraid of, you know, clogging up the system or, or getting sick. That's, that's scary. I, I get why people are freaking out, you know? Um, I but, love that about the, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jeff. Oh, no, I was just going to say, but the truth is, is that every meeting I go to, there's day counters, day counters who have started since the beginning of the, the social distancing order. So people are getting sober even now. That's awesome. I love that about the program, about AA, like how you say a doubling down on basics, because it does provide this like fundamental practice for people. 
that like a lot of people who aren't in that program who are just getting sober or who are falling in that category of like, oh, I don't need to be sober. I just, you know, I'm drinking because it's quarantine right now and, you know, whatever. Um, it's like, it's the same the same philosophy is really what works. It's like going back to some basics of how you take care of yourself and checking in with people and keeping connection and um, a certain type of, of just awareness of where you're at and um, really basic things that tend to keep you more grounded in this time period and release that pressure that tends to build if you're not doing it. Absolutely. It's not even sobriety, that's just for everybody. Yeah, yeah. it was a good time to just stay connected. Exactly. Yeah, because it's people. It's just an. I find it really interesting because these these huge things happen in our world, and people really do go. There is this strange societal acceptance of just like of drinking a lot or using drugs. Um, you know, <laughs> not heroin. Obviously, there's not the same type of acceptance of that. Thankfully, right, but like smoking a lot of weed or or just like not taking care of yourself that's something that really is prevalent mm -hmm. and it's coming from a place where there isn't that same fundamental practice that people can pull into and so i think it's an interesting like there's a lot that um non-addicts can learn from the program and learn from that process totally. i know that i've um you know i've toured with some some very strong personalities that um, you know belong to NAA, and there are definitely things that I've taken from that not being an addict that I've pulled into my day-to-day -day life of those, like you said, just those fundamental things of you know checking in with people. And right now, all of those things can be put to use, whether you're an addict or not you know, checking in on two or three people a day and just making sure everybody's doing okay. Being able to scan your body and see how you feel every day, how you actually feel <laughs> and having to acknowledge, I don't feel good today. I don't feel, you know, like I'm gonna accomplish anything today and feel a little lost today. You know, that those are, I think it's a it's an opportunity for anybody at this point to to look at those things and be able to go, well, these are things that people that are in recovery do every day. And now I'm doing them and hey, they're pretty helpful, actually. Um, so um, I do have some questions about, <clears throat> I guess, and I'm not really sure how to phrase it exactly, like levels of sobriety, kind of bouncing off what Taryn just said on, you know, there is a a very like a perception, I guess, that that, you know, oh, work from home, wine o'clock thing is, it's funny. You know, a lot of people look at it and they laugh and, you know, everyone's laughing at the memes right now, but that's a reality to some people. And, you know, I think that, you know, like Taryn spoke here, here in California, we refer to it as California sober, where you don't, you don't do hard drugs and you don't drink a lot, but you smoke weed. Or, you know, I think that I'm curious about different levels of sobriety and I guess how people at home, I guess what your, your advice to people that are at different levels of sobriety to keep it from going to that next level would be. Dave? <laughs> About once, um, every other month, I will get uh, an IM or an email from someone that I don't know saying, okay, so I, I saw you on that webinar or on that podcast or, or whatever, or those articles in, in Alternative Press. And I used to drink like all the time. And now I just drink on the weekends. And I think what you do is so cool. And I totally want to do it. So can you tell me how? I'm like, okay, you're still getting drunk on the weekends. Um, you know, it's like, okay, the thing is, like we said earlier, it's a progressive thing. And, and if you reach the point where it was a full-time gig and you were getting hammered all the time, you might be able to control it for a short period of time. Um, you know, you might be able to stop and then restart and feel like you're in control for a while. But if you're truly an alcoholic, it'll get out of control again. It's just a matter of time. Um, so there's no real stopping it or controlling it unless you actually get sober. You know, so the whole, and I've seen people kind of switch drug of choice, like they'll get into cocaine and then 
come back off of it and then they've substituted weed, but they're smoking weed all day long. Right. Um, you know, and the thing is, and, and weed seems really innocuous, it really does, and it's, it's not that expensive and you can have a manageable life and be stoned all the time. But for me, it's that stunt in emotional maturity. Like if you're using all day, every day, you're not growing as a person. And if I'm dealing with a guy who's 40 years old, but he acts like he's 19, it's like, you're really annoying. Um, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but it's like, oh my God, dude, no, I don't want to play Xbox and order a pizza. Like, can we please go vote? Let's do something with it, you know? So even the stuff that seems innocuous, it'll get you one way or another. It's got negative consequences, you know? I don't know if I answered your question or if I kind of went sideways on that. Yeah, no, you did. And you actually just brought up another really good point, that stunted emotional growth. You know, if, yeah. if that's, that's a really easy way of being able to acknowledge that maybe you do have a problem as when... Yeah you notice yourself that you're, you know. But anybody that's on a daily basis, you stop growing. So like I was 16, 17 when I really started hit, and I got sober almost 29 and I was in many ways like an 18 year old emotionally. Um, you know, and I, I like, I, I just, there were, I could show up and act like I was kind of functioning, but there was no emotional maturity whatsoever. You know, I took some catching up and now 21 years later, I'm like emotionally like 24 or five. So like, I'm really showing some growth here. Like I'm really. <laughs> Jay, we really like how you are. <laughs> There's a lot about where you're at. Do not encourage him. <laughs> no, right? The other thing about, about uh, California Sobers, <laughs> which I just love that. And I just learned that that was the phrase recently. I love that. Um, but what I, I think is really important about that too, is that, you know, it's not just that you're not growing, but what you're also doing is you're preventing yourself from actually, from being able to um, have a sense of like freedom on the inside because you're, that pressure is building, 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 and you're relying on something like weed to regulate your system really. That's what people are actually doing when they're using it very often. Yeah. Like, yeah, it, it's an escapism thing. Yeah, it's all these other things. But a lot of times, I know a lot of people that use it as a way to deal with their anxiety, right? To deal with that pressure that's building inside of them. But if that is what they're relying upon, then there's, it's never going to get better. Like you're, you're always going to have that anxiety as a default baseline, you know? And I, you know, and I, I think that there's really important moments where uh, medication is really needed, where Xanax can be really helpful and those things can be really helpful. I'm not like across the board anti any of that stuff. Um, however, I think that there's a reliance upon that that happens that's just as dangerous as going down the rabbit hole of drinking or using harder drugs because it just keeps us from being fully actualized. It keeps us from knowing ourselves um, and it keeps us sort of in this box that we kind of can't get out of. Um, and we're sort of like at the mercy of our own pain all the time as a result of that. So there's no freedom from that actual pain. There's just this like momentary relief from it. Mm -hmm. And you never develop coping skills. Exactly. And then it's interesting for me in my work now because there's, you know, people rely on, on weed and it's, <laughs> the pandemic is a lung disease. And it's an interesting thing yeah. actually that it's like, it's a comfort for people, right? Yet it's actually putting them at a higher risk by smoking. And it says something to me, if we're not able to stop that during a time where that is putting us at a higher risk, you know, and that is also something to look at. Absolutely. I think like, it's very interesting. This, this all came up to my, my sponsor, who's now got like 20 years or something. He uh, was like me also a heroin user, meth user, uh, got sober for 10 years and then decided he'd be okay smoking pot because that's just pot, right? That's just pot. It's okay. And actually he like ruined his whole career that way. Like, because, you know, if you become the type of person, you know, you really get good at winding yourself around an obsessive behavior like that. It's, you know, you gotta, it's more than just even drugs, I think, you know, like I, I have friends that also now uh, go to Al-Anon, go to Overeaters Anonymous. There's a lot of different things that you can obsess over. And I think like some of the step work that's in the program, you know, there's a lot of stuff in Alcoholics Anonymous and other 12 step programs. that's like almost like Trojan horse, like mm -hmm. behavioral therapy, socializing, like there's all kinds of stuff in there that ends up 
uh, treating something deeper even than the addiction itself mm -hmm. um, that I'm sure Dave could speak to as well. Well, phase one recovery is when you actually stop doing whatever your drug of choice is. And phase two recovery is when you actually get better. You know, we talk about how people are dry drunks, like they just stop and some people can accomplish that, you know, and, and I know that just about everybody, their first year of recovery, you're still looking for some kind of visceral rush. You know, your textbook alcoholic or addict is restless, irritable and discontent all day long. And that's why they start using. Like for me, I just was going out of my skin all day and I discovered a couple of shots of vodka and I was, you know, taller and funnier and better looking and confident and all those things that I wanted to be. I know it's hard to believe I was funnier, but you know, and so that first year I'm looking to fill up that, that hole with something, you know, and everybody is, and you're just kind of bouncing off of each other and you get into obsessive behaviors and you stay up all night and I drank two pots of coffee a day and you know, whatever it is, the internet or relationships or gambling and you just try to hang on long enough that eventually you smooth off the edges enough and you know most people get a little bit of therapy and enough meetings under your belt and you start getting better and doing work yeah but like jeff said there's a lot of bait and switch there's a lot of pretty subtle stuff going on that all of a sudden six nine months in you're like i don't feel awful anymore it's kind of a revelation mm -hmm. yeah it's it is that underlying stuff because you know we talked last week about how we have to let our hearts break in order to be human right in order to really be alive yeah. and but our entire defense system is in business to keep us from having that heartbreak to keep us from feeling the pain that we're holding inside from the experiences that we've had yeah. but until we process out those experiences yeah. like they will they will be in our unconscious and they will drive our patterning they will drive more um, toxic relationships they'll drive um you know isolation even when we're not in isolation actually you know, I mean, so many different things that that stuff can drive and that avoidance of that pain, people will set up their entire lives to avoid the pain that they have inside. Yep. And this is one mechanism that that is avoided is, is using drugs or alcohol, but people do it all different ways through work, through sex, through so many different things. Mm -hmm. And it really is the other steps, like you guys said, of AA that help that freedom from the addiction, right? That are what you're really working when you're working the steps is you're working that process. You're working, you're talking about your problems. You're, you're talking about how you feel. You're learning how to even know what you feel. You know, I mean, that's, that goes across the board for any of us, whether we are in a program or not. It's, it's the working of those experiences that we have not yet processed that's going to give us the, the true relief. And that's what everybody's looking for. Yep. A little bit of relief from the inside of their head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my perception of so much has changed because when I first got sober and they would talk about, you know, serenity, and I would think that just sounds like boredom. Like when nothing, and now like, yeah. no, that's, that's serenity. I'm totally okay with hanging out in the backyard and not doing anything. Yeah. It's literally the dream state. Leaving my phone inside the house and going out back and doing, watching literally plants grow. It's heavenly. Yeah. You know what is another dream state actually that I've experienced is the ability to like be okay with being super sad and scared. Yeah. Actually. And and to really be like going through a hard time and to trust that I will there will be another side, that I'll be okay. That's you, literally my definition of serenity. Like the worst times I've had sober, knowing not today and probably not tomorrow, and maybe not even next week, but it's going to be okay. I didn't have that mindset growing up everything was catastrophic. Absolutely. It's like, um, it's like despair, hopelessness, like, oh, that's it. This is the thing I was waiting for. That's just going to destroy everything, you know? Right. And it really does take like one of the things that I feel about my own path in life, which has really not been quite easy, um, is that I have learned over time, like, no matter how much is destroyed around me, no matter how much I lose, no matter how much pain I'm in, um, I actually know now at 37 years old, I know I'll, it's, it, I'm going to be okay. <laughs> and that is like huge. That's a really huge thing. But you only know that if you actually feel all of the shit that you've been through, like you won't ever know that if you're spending your life avoiding it. Um, I have a question about enablers. Um, you know, I, I know that some of the most dangerous times for uh, folks that I've was near were when the enablers were around and that in the lack of enabler environment it was easier i think to avoid um, some of the issues 
Is there such a thing as a Zoom enabler? Can you be, Jeff, can you be coerced or coaxed because of a conversation you're having with a bunch of people who may be enabling via Zoom? That's a good question. I suppose hypothetically it's possible. I mean, um, I don't know. I do a book club each week um, and people drink on there and I've never been like, I wish I was drinking because they're drinking. But I, I suppose that other people under the right circumstances of like a kind of camaraderie that that there could be something like that i mean it's it's hard for me to say i think my judge of enabling like my scale is that like i was in a touring rock band for 22 <laughs> years or whatever and it's like you know that's just the name the the normal sort the the, the state of being is is just go for it <laughs> whatever yeah, so. it is have some yeah, uh, so in that sense, perhaps it's easier because we're not physically in the space of those who might enable us. Yeah, but, and I think it's a chore to like, I just imagining trying to go cop right now, like imagining standing on a corner waiting for some guy and the kind of like, just, just, yeah. just With a mask on. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, I'd be out there with a mask on and then take it off to snort some fucking shit that I, I mean, you know, that I just, who knows what it is. Yeah, but it could be concentrated like, COVID. I don't know. Right. Isn't you know? It, it, it like the fact that, you know, thinking about that process right now, you will recoil from it like from a hot flame, like, oh my God, that would suck so bad. Yeah. You know, like. That's as advertised in the program, right? Right. I just, like, I just, I don't miss any of that. You know, just waiting six hours later than, you know, drug dealer standard time. Right. Two hours later than you could possibly imagine. You know? After you're really sick, then he finally shows up. Right. Now, um, I probably should have planned this yesterday. You know, it's interesting. Somebody brought up um, that, that the step work is like stuff that could be useful for non-addicts. And like when I go to meetings that have really like older guys in it, they'll sometimes be like, yeah, it's really tough. My kid's going through it. He's like 22 not an addict, not one of us. I almost wish he was so that he could find some tools for dealing with his shit because he is suffering. And like, I, I'm his dad. I, he's not going to listen to anything that I say, you know? And, and I just think that's a really interesting uh, thing is that like a lot of the step work of actually trying to maintain and, and get sobriety is just stuff that's really good. You know, like four, five, six, seven, eight, nine is all about like making lists of your flaws and getting in there and like talking to another person about them and then making a list of people you've wronged and trying to make amends. I mean, that's just like one of those fundamental human things. Like if you can make a, amends to the people that you've wronged, like it really does lift the burden of being alive, which is so painful, right? To cause other people harm and just be like, well, screw them. You know what I mean? Like you, you keep that with you and it doesn't stop hurting when you wrong people. So yeah, I just thought that was a really interesting, uh, like sort of like we dipped in and then came out of it. I really, I actually, a, a couple of months ago, um, I got an opportunity to go see Russell Brandt, who is a huge advocate of the 12 steps. And he's written his entire, he's actually on a tour right now. He's kind of, what he's done is he's taken the 12 steps and not turned them into comedy, but he has his Russell Brand way of going through the 12 steps with you. And I found, I, I just like, it was two hours long and, you know, I walked out of it and even as not an addict, I didn't go as an addict to like, and also to be honest with you, wasn't a gigantic Russell Brand fan. I just was so intrigued by the idea of those 12 steps and what I could pull from them into my day-to-day -day life. And I walked out of it with such a different such a different viewpoint, exactly what you just said, you know, the, you know, seven, eight, nine, and 10, like those just being things of general common human decency, yeah. you know, things that you need to be able to like bring into your life to walk back out and feel at peace with some of the things that maybe you've done in your life. And I, I would, absolutely like recommend to anybody to go see it or listen to the audiobook of it because it's it's not just you know we we think of these things as things just for addicts and they're not just for addicts like you can take those steps and integrate them into your day and or your life and it it makes a huge difference huge difference so 
Um, well, if I could riff off of that for a second. Yeah. There's something like 249 different 12-step programs. All of the 12 steps and all of them are exactly the same, except for one word in the first step, which is either alcohol or drugs or sex or overeating. And the 12 steps are literally 12 very simple spiritual exercises. They are not denominational in any way. They will work for anybody that wants to just, like you said, incorporate just a little bit of something into their lives, their coping skills. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they, they did their homework. This wasn't like divine providence. They based it on something called the Oxford Group, which was a religious foundation. And then there's a book called The Varieties of Religious Experiences by a guy named William James, who's a psychologist, who discovered that something like 98% of people that had developed some form of faith in their lives had been through some kind of trauma and using some spiritual concepts could develop some kind of faith in something. It doesn't have to be a God of any kind, but just getting confident in themselves. Um, and so it, it's worth exploring for anybody. Well, and to say for that too, you know, trauma is what happens when you go through trauma is that it's a fracturing of yourself. It's a fracturing of your sense of self, especially if it's childhood trauma and you haven't had the chance to develop a cohesive sense of self first, right? So when you have a fractured sense of self, you then are living from your defense mechanisms and you think that they're truth, right? So you think like these different versions of fight, flight, or freeze that we go into are your truth, are your identity. Trauma healing is the integration of self and spirituality, whether it's like religion, meditation, like any type of, of any of that, right? Is actually what it's doing is it's bringing you into that unconditional sense of self. It's bringing you into that deeper sense of self. And there's an integration that happens there. And from that place, like life is not as scary. There's more of a, like for <laughs> risking a little bit of a cliche, there's more of like a oneness. But it's really true because it's like you can connect into something within you that now you can connect to other humans in a different way. You can connect to the world around you. You can enjoy the backyard listening to the birds chirping because you have a deeper place to rest, you know? And I heard um, from a friend who's in the program one time say that AA is like spirituality for dummies and that it like brings you <laughs> and that it like brings you like it's like a fast track in a certain way to having that spiritual connection um and i really think that's important whether we're coming from an addict place or we're coming from I, I think a lot of addiction does come from trauma to be honest with you at least from from the work that i do a lot of it comes from something that happens right that makes these defense mechanisms come into play sometimes um, so that connection, that integrated sense of self is always going to give you a different baseline. So any way in which we get there is, is good in my eyes. That's really interesting. I had, I, I remember before I was able to get sober, I had an integ integrative therapy, therapist, you know, and, and she would say stuff to me all the time that I'd be like, huh, you know, she'd be like, okay, well, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about your shadow side and this kind of thing. She'd say all this stuff and I'd be like, that's. I wonder what she's talking about, but that's interesting, you know? And then, and then I started trying to get sober and like some of the ideas that were coming in, I, I sort of didn't understand them either. And I actually uh, got so desperate. I went down to Mexico and, and tried this alternative therapy that's not legal in the U S called Ibogaine, which is like a massive hallucinogen that really confronts you with trauma that you've buried. And um, when I came out of it and I went into AA and, and 12 step work, I really saw how connected all of that stuff was. And I saw that like the trauma that I had seen and the shadow self that I had seen when I was under this treatment was all the stuff that my therapist had been trying to get me to talk about like back then. I finally called her up and said like, wow, I get what you're saying now. Like this makes so much sense now that I'm trying to like integrate these things and deal with the trauma and, and all the step work stuff is just such, such good practice for, um, you know, dealing with some of that stuff. But it was a really amazing to me to see like a lot of these approaches are so, yeah. are, are, it's almost like the different religions, like Dave was saying, like, you know what I mean? It's like, they're so different. And yet you boil down the 98% of them have to do with this one specific thing. It's amazing. Exactly. And, and like you're, when you're dealing with a traumatized system, you don't want to like go overboard too much where you're like all of a sudden like sometimes there's certain meditation and certain things that can be too much for somebody who's been through trauma because it actually brings you into the trauma vortex it brings you into way too much into it trauma is overwhelmed so we don't want to overwhelm ourselves in the way that we process it and i think that's part of why the 12 steps really works because it's steps 
right? Because it's like, it actually paces out a process for you so that you're not just like hit with, oh shit, I have to like change everything all at once. Or I have to face everything that I've been through all at once. You know, it's like, like in the work that I do, I work mostly with the um, nervous system with, with trauma. And so I want to pace that out bit by bit, you know, like we'll touch into it. We'll work with it a little bit, you know, let some of it come out and then we're going to kind of bring you back. You know what I mean? So that it's not just throwing you more into overwhelm. Baby steps. Baby steps. Yep. Karen, did you want to add something to the enabler comment as well? I think. Oh yeah. I was, I was, the thing about the enabling was an interesting question because it's not, I, to me, it's not just like other people saying, Hey, let's go drink or like, let's have a virtual happy hour or something like that. It's, it's also those in denial around you. And I know, um, you know, some people whose uh, siblings are going through a really hard time and their parents, you know, have a hard time accepting that that's what's happening. And because of that, they, they are always taking that call you know, and always um, making sort of well-intentioned, right, but excuses for them. And that is absolutely enabling. And it's, you know, the people like around you are anyone, any one of us, like our limitations will, will speak to that stuff. You know, like if you have a family members who are not able to touch into their own experiences of pain, their own stuff, they're not gonna be able to admit that somebody else has stuff, you know? So that's a, that's, and I'm assuming with people being home right now with their families, there's a whole lot of different experiences happening where they're potentially home with parents who are alcoholics or addicts or siblings who are, are alcoholics or addicts. And it's going to be highlighting a lot of that, I think, right now. Yeah. And I think we said the other day that there's a, there's a kind of permission giving that comes about when, you know, you post out online, hey, it's five o'clock somewhere. And you know, that one person that responds, yes, it is. Now you've got your permission to take advantage of that, right? Is, is that a thing? There, there's a thing in, in American law called conspiracy to commit a crime where the, the penalty gets much greater. If, because statistically speaking, if two or more people are planning a crime, they're vastly more um, likely to actually attempt it. So that can work negatively and positively. You know, you get two or three or four alcoholics together and they're trying to get sober, you're much more likely to actually maintain sobriety. Whereas, you know, you get a couple, three, four people going, let's go out and get hammered. You're much more likely to, you know, they talk about the 12 step is like Jeff said, is when you're trying to help the next guy get sober and they suggest never do that alone because a person in, in alcoholism will be much more likely to take you out rather than you get them to get sober. I have a question uh, that kind of goes along with that. It's, it's actually a, a question that someone on our Facebook posted. Um, are you feeling right now that you're a better sponsor now that you have more time and availability? And if so, do you feel like there are some addicts that might come out of this with more confidence since they have the ability to work things, you know, they, they have more time right now to work it? Uh, that's, that's a good question. And that seems like it could be something that happens. I don't feel like I'm a better sponsor because I have more time right now, because generally you just, you just have to call your sponsee back. It's just a weird thing. Like, I don't know. As soon as I start to be like, I'll call him tomorrow. Like there's a little voice. It's like, no, dude, you got to call him now. Like what happens if something happens to him before, you know, it just, it just starts becoming this little nagging thing where you're like, it keeps you accountable. Yeah, damn it, I gotta call this guy. And you know what? I should probably call my sponsor after I talk to him. <laughs> well, Steph, you actually made a really great point in the beginning that I wanted to speak to you anyway about how, like, your the first few weeks, you were, you know, calling your sponsee, calling your sponsor. You're like, I've got this, you know, whatever. And it's like actually helping. There's all this stuff out there right now. I was reading this article in the Times about the science of helping out and how those, I think I sent it to you guys in the panel, like, the those who are putting themselves in a role of trying to help are tending to cope better, right? However, there is definitely this other thing where we can totally be avoiding our own feelings by helping. 
you know? And, and like, (laughs) I know I talked to Dave privately the other day and John Prine had passed away and I was literally crying (laughs) to Dave. And I was like, I was like, John Prine died. And he was like, I'm sure that's what it is. I'm sure, Karen, I'm sorry for your loss, you know, (laughs) like, but like the truth is, is that I deal with heavy content all day, you know, really heavy stuff, like, and, and if I'm not being careful and I'm not taking care of myself and I'm not going out for walks or hikes or something like that, and, or I'm not meditating, I'm not doing what I need, that shit will stack and I will have a breakdown about John Prine dying, which is actually very minimal compared to other ways I could break down. (laughs) which was you know like getting mad at my partner or like all different things that it can come out it leaks out in these different ways you know totally yeah I mean it's funny too I think somebody was mentioning uh you know out of the enablers one form of enabling is the is the like the family member who just won't acknowledge what's going on and thereby you don't have to feel like you have a problem because you're like mom doesn't seem to even care right I must be doing all right and it's like Um, it's funny when you go through that and come out the other side and you start to be like, oh, I see exactly why, you know, it wasn't a big deal for them because they've got this thing going on. And that can actually be like, when it gets really hard is like dealing, dealing with either other people in your orbit who may have like addiction problems or other people in your orbit who have, you know, things that are, that they can't look at, you know, or can't deal with. Um, and, and it's weird because like, I, I started going to Al-Anon, which is a weird thing. I don't have anybody that's like, so like, I'm not like, you know, the child of, of, a, of a brutal alcoholic. That's like, really, it's, it's just more like for me to deal, me to deal with all that, you know, like to still love the people that enabled me and to still uh, love the people who are unable to get sober in their lives. And that when I'm around them, I feel insane because I'm like, there's nothing I can do to help this person. They're making me crazy. Um, and that's like a, a big one is, is just dealing. Uh, you know, it's like you said, like, like I would put all my fucking emotions on the one person that I know that's still not sober. That's making me crazy and call Dave and be like this fucking guy. And it's like, maybe I better figure out what's really going on with me. (laughs) Yeah. Boundary work too. Right. Yeah, totally. Do you guys, Dave and Jeff, do you have any, um, suggestions for those people who are potentially dealing with family members who either they're home with it or they're not able to be home also like they're they're almost feeling like powerless because they're not there with them like that's got to be a situation that's happening a lot right now i know it's happening in my orbit of really close friends i have someone really really close to me going through something like that like what's your advice for that how would you work with that but as simple as it sounds you do what you can do and you stop there and a lot of us struggle with that boundary. Like, no, 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 I'm gonna keep calling them every 20 minutes until they pick up the phone because that way you're not only driving yourself crazy, but you're also not helping the situation at all. It's painful to wanna help somebody that doesn't want help or that you can't help right now. You know, and you gotta just keep checking in with yourself and making sure you're okay through it. Like what is driving you to wanna change that situation so badly? Well, and what if it's the, um, I'm thinking of a particular uh, close friend who I consider family basically, who's. A uh, sibling is going through the addiction, but the mother is the ena- is enabling by not being able to fully address it. And so the concern in that sense, it's almost like, I know I can't do anything about my sibling, but I've got, I want my mom to stop doing that, right? What about that? Like, that's almost like a different take on it a little bit, but an experience that probably happens a lot. In, in 12 step, they talk about attraction rather than promotion you can't grab them and bring them to getting better. You can offer help. You can say, look, here's this person's number or here's where a meeting for al is. And, but whether or not they actually take advantage of that, you know, you do everything you can and you stop there. And that stuff is hard. I mean, that stuff is hard every time. Like I basically, I swapped out one of my AANA meetings for an al meeting a week, just so I could, you know, have some support there. And the people that are struggling with stuff in al in some ways it's so much harder because it's, it's just, there's no sense of like abstinence. Like I just say no and just don't pick up the next drink. It's like, no, I'm going to pick up the next call and how I deal with it is like, it's going to be hard. Um, Before before we kind of start going into more territory, um, we're actually probably going to end up doing a part two on this um that will 
kind of address living at home right now with someone that's struggling or maybe um, not of been home for a long, long time. And so now you're home seeing things that draw your attention. And I think our part two is probably gonna have a lot to do with what it's like um, in a time of quarantine, living with someone that's struggling with these addictions and, or, you know, people and how they're coping. And, you know, if you're- This is a totally hypothetical situation. With, what? This is a totally hypothetical situation. No, um, we're actually going to do a part two. Oh. <laughs> it's such a broad, like, I kind of notice us, like, starting to go down that path, and oh, we could spend a whole thing. another, you know, probably <laughs> two hours on, yeah. on all of that, but we only have an hour. So um, is there anything that you guys want to say before we open this up to the Q&A session? We're going to attach links to a whole lot of different support. Um, so if anybody's listening along and thinking they might maybe need to reach out, also my my website, the road to rehab.com is on there someplace. There's an email address there. It was just thinking maybe I should try one of these Zoom meetings. You can do it from home right now. It's, you can be anonymous. It's worth trying. Reach out if you need some help. Yeah, and, and Dave, I wanted to ask you real quick before we, we transition. There was a time period for me where I w did have a lot of unresolved trauma before I knew about doing that work, before I had the right support to do the work I needed. And I was sober for about seven years um, during that time to, because I didn't, I wasn't doing the work. I didn't know what my stuff was. I didn't know what it was. I actually, I went to meetings during that time. For me, I didn't end up having the disease of, of addiction. I had really deep trauma, a so really deep trauma history. And once I reconciled that trauma, that the coping mechanisms that I was using fell away. Um, and I know that that's, I'm, I'm really grateful for that. But I did really take support during that time. Um, and there was a part of me that knew, like I knew, I remember like feeling a little uncomfortable sometimes because I knew I didn't necessarily have that disease, but I really wanted that support and it really helped me. Is that welcome? Is that okay? If like, like, can people just try it out, so to speak? Can you like, do you need to know definitively that you have the disease to go and take advantage of the support? Oh, did he freeze? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say that there is a, you know, the only requirement is a desire to stop drinking is one of the, is one of the, the things that's said in the traditions. So, um, you know, it used to be, and it used to be apparently, the only thing that's required to attend is a desire to stop, a, a sincere desire to stop yeah. drinking. And they dropped sincere because they were like, look, if you want to stop drinking, you can come to this. Yeah. I mean, if you think this might be a part of it. You can come. You don't have to be committed to knowing it's right for you. And I, I think like I've had a few friends that came, checked out, and were like, I don't know, I didn't really hear anything that resonated with me. It's like, hey, if you can go to a few AA meetings and not hear anything that sounds right, you might be in the wrong place. It's, you know, it's totally yeah. possible. <laughs> yeah, as I, I felt like, you know what, like I'm I'm choosing the road of sobriety. I didn't necessarily get sober through AA, but I definitely wanted to figure my shit out. And so I knew I couldn't do that if I was like smoking too much weed or I was like doing these other things. And I really gained support during that time from it. I have a deep appreciation for it for that. And um and I just think that right now in this isolation time, I I if, if that's a welcome thing that I want people who maybe they're not like, am I an alcoholic? Am I not like, I don't know if it matters right now. Like if you totally. need that support, you know what I mean? If you need that support, it's there. And it's actually like a really awesome group of people usually that are super real. And then there's this like relief that can come whether you identify as that or not. If you want to have a healthier lifestyle and take care of yourself better right now, maybe that's a, an option, you know? Totally. If you do go to a 12-step meeting like that, make sure it's, it's, there's a little O in the guide. It just means an open meeting, which means anybody is welcome. As okay. opposed to if there's a C, that means closed, then only if you're an alcoholic or an addict. Okay, that's what I was wondering. So I, assume, I remember there's like some stuff with that, and so I just wanted to be clear before I just said that out to the public. <laughs> and I disappeared for a minute because we lost power. I'm back on my phone. Uh, you're back. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Dave, welcome back. <laughs> good, good to have you with us. Um, so this actually kind of went exactly how 
I was anticipating. Um, we don't have any questions because I think that, you know, sobriety is for a lot of people, it's a very personal thing and it's very hard to, to ask questions, um, you know, in front of people or to a panel of people, or there's a lot of fear of what if you see my name on there or et cetera. So if, anybody has any questions or wants to talk to someone one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, I think we say it every episode, you can find us on Instagram, on Showmaker Symposium, you can find us on Facebook and, you know, you can send, send a message and, you know, whether it's Taryn or Dave or, you know, even Jim or myself or, you know, Jeff is willing to help or Tamsin that we had in the first episode, like, We've got a pretty wide variety of people that are willing to to jump in and to help out right now and we want to make sure that everybody knows that you are not alone out there and i know it may feel like it and it may feel really scary and you may feel completely isolated but there are a million different ways to reach out across the internet right now and everyone is in the same boat once again you know we're we're all in that reaching out to, you know, a meeting online or a friend online. So don't feel like you're alone by any means. Um, Dave, what you got to wrap this up? The best time to get sober is a year ago. The second best time to get sober <laughs> is today. So if you followed along this far and you want to reach out by all means, everything will get easier after you do. And it's okay for things to be hard is yeah. the other thing. I hope that if there's anything that we're, you guys are getting from this too, like Jeff said in the beginning, working with that shame cycle, right? Like, I hope that like, if anything, I want people to know, like I've been through a lot of hard shit. Most of us on this panel been through, all of us on this panel have been through a lot of hard shit. It's okay to have gone through hard shit. It's okay for things to be hard right now it's so okay to need help we all do even us therapists have therapists grand therapists yeah we, we call it <laughs> we call it the, the grand therapist that's what, <laughs> and you know it's like we all need that support um and sometimes that's just the first little baby step is is knowing that that's okay jim i'm thankful for all of you and i'm i'm thankful for our um our tribe and trying to get through this together and and hope that we can continue to offer meaningful ways for them to connect and feel like they're not alone and we're not alone grateful grateful for jeff for showing up today too thanks for having me glad to be yeah. here always yeah. thank you so much Jeff. it was really great having you yeah and um on our instagram we also just so that anybody knows we did post um on instagram and facebook um, you've got resources. Um, there's an entire list of places to go and numbers and websites. So you can get that on the Showmaker Symposium website with the, the pictures on Instagram if you're a more visual person instead. <laughs> it's, there's a million ways. So um, with that, we will hopefully see all of you next week. Have a great weekend, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>